following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Sacraments of the Gnostic Church. We are going to explain the sacraments that were instituted since ancient times in the Church of Christ. which, of course, uh, has its roots in Egypt. Because the Holy Gnostic Church is a church uh, that uh, is situated in the superior dimensions And that in this day and age has its uh, physical exponents in the physical world, in our Gnostic uh, movement, Gnostic organizations. The Gnostic Church was instituted by the Master. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, in the Middle East. But of course, (coughs) it's a church that has a long history. It's related with the mysteries of uh, ancient Egypt. It has its roots in Atlantis related with the Neptunian Amentian epoch, directly related with the world of Yesod, the fourth dimension. As you know, Gnosis is a Greek word for knowledge. And this uh, doctrine of knowledge is related with the famous tree of knowledge of the book of Genesis. And uh, that many times in many lectures, we point that in the tree of life, this hieroglyphic, we find that the uh, related knowledge with the mysterious sephira, that. So it is good for you to have this uh, graphic of the tree of life in order to understand what the Gnostic Church is. It is related with the Sephira Da'at which is uh, in any relation with Tifereth and with Yesod, with the 
middle pillar of the tree of life. In order to understand the sacraments, we have to understand the word itself. As you observe, the word sacrament comes from sacred. And the other word is amen. Sacred amen. Sacraments. When we investigate the word Amen, we discover that uh, it's a word uh, written with three Hebrew letters, Aleph, Mem, and Nun. So, these three letters, Amen, Mem, uh, Aleph and Nun are in direct relation with the three primary forces that in Kabbalah are called uh, Keter, Chokmah, and Bina. These uh, three forces are what we call the Holy Three Unity. It means that Whichever sephira we take from this triangle, Ketejo Mabina, whichever sephira of the three of them is always related with the other two. So when we talk about Keter, we know that within Keter is Chokma and Bina. Within Chokma is Bina and Keter. And within Bina is Keter and Chokma. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father is Aleph, the breath of life, that oxygen that we breathe. Represented by the letter Aleph, that's why the letter Aleph uh, symbolizes the air. Mem is related with water. Directly related with the mother, which is always uh, applied to the Holy Spirit. But remember that the Holy Spirit contains both forces, positive and negative. So, Mem, in this case, symbolizes the Divine Mother, the feminine aspect. And uh, Nun, as you see and remember in many lectures, is related with the Messiah. Yeshua, the son of Nun, which is the Savior, related, of course, with the letter N, Nun. So there in the letter, or oh, in the word Amen, we find the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Keter, Homa, Bina. There are three Amens. The first Amen is the Father, the second Amen is the Son, and the third Amen is the Holy Spirit. So when we talk and say the sacraments of the Gnostic Church, we're talking about the way in which we acquire the influence of the three Amens in the path of initiation. So, the Gnostic Church is the church that teaches how to acquire these sacraments. And of course, it's always uh, being taught in different ways, different manners. In, in, in ancient, ancient Egypt, <clears throat> these uh, sacraments were instituted. But of course, at that time, the three primary forces together were called Osiris. And uh, they were symbolizing these three primary forces 
of Osiris coming from the Ains of Or. As you know, the Ains of Or is the third aspect of the Absolute <coughs> above Keter. The solar absolute, which in Egypt was symbolized by Ra. So, within that Ains of, as you know, Ra reside the three primary atoms, which every single monad has within. When a monad self realizes himself and acquire the power of those three primary forces within, and then you call it Amon Ra or Amen Ra. You see the word Amen Ra or Amon Ra. Also, we say when these uh, three primary forces manifest in the universe as a cosmo creator, and then uh, we call it in an Egypt uh, uh, terminology. Osiris Ra. So this is how uh, it was uh, in ancient times uh, pronounced. So when you read uh, in the dead, the book of the dead of the Egyptians, <coughs> the name Osiris Ra, you are of course pointing at the three primary forces and the ace of all which is above Keter. In other words, this Osiris Ra is what in Kabbalah is called yod He vav He, the sacred tetragrammaton, because Osiris represents the Amen, the three primary forces, and Ra is the solar absolute. So there you have the four particles, or the four Elements in order to form the sacred name of God, Yodhe Bavhe, the Tetragrammaton. So, Amen Ra, or Osiris Ra, is that that precisely uh, we invoke and we want to bring down when we perform the sac sacred amends, the sacrament, or the sacraments. To understand this is indispensable. Otherwise, we take everything just literally or mechanically, like un as, uh, unfortunately had happened uh, in the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, related uh, with the Master Jesus who instituted that church through his doctrine. We had to understand that this uh, Amen also reside in the physical body. We breathe the air, the Aleph, thanks to Amen we are alive. The A, the Aleph, is in the lungs. That in many lectures we explain goes into the blood through the circulatory system and respiratory system in order to, uh, to uh, purify the blood, which is the Mem. Any uh, fluid in the physical organism relates to Mem. The main blood, of course, the main fluid is the blood, which is the oxygen. Or we say the father and uh, the mother, or the Holy Spirit, which eventually transforms itself into the entity of Zimen, the Enseminis, within which the letter Nun crystallizes of the sperm or ovum. So that is precisely the Amen. 
how those forces descend into the human organism and how the neophyte who wants to enter into the path must know because uh, salvation comes through Nun, the Messiah, which is the sexual potency. So, we have also uh, know how to manage the superior forces of the blood and the oxygen. That's why every Gnostic practice relates to the heart, relates to the nose, the breathing, relates to the sex. As you see, here we find the three brains that we always talk so these three brains develop in the process of uh, our physical body, the evolution of our physical body. From childhood to the epoch in which we are, according to our age. So the whole purpose, of course, as we said, of every soul, every spirit in this universe is to acquire the inner realization of these three primary forces. And this is why the souls are always prepared in order to receive the three forces of the sacraments of uh, Osiris Ra or Amon Ra Amen Ra or the three Amens Father, Son and Holy Spirit with this we are instituting here explaining that Christ which is a Greek word means the anointed one so, so the sacrament is how we learn how to anoint, to be anointed. In order for that force that we call Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which are forces to crystallize in our body, mind, soul, and spirit. In order to Christify ourselves. The Christification, Christ Crucify ourselves. That's why in ancient Egypt, when somebody was assimilating these cosmic forces of Amon Ra, of Osiris Ra, they will call him or her an Osirified One. In this day and age, we call it a Christified One, utilizing the Greek word Christ. With this, we are uh, explaining here that Christ is a, a force, it's an energy that manifests through these three primary forces. The most beautiful atoms of this energy express themselves through the sun. That's why the sun is always called the Christ, which manifests in different levels through initiation or through the sacraments. So, of course, in order to understand these sacraments or sacred amends, we have to go into that, which is the mystery, mysterious gnosis, knowledge, in which we find the transcendental church, the highest level. Why is there in that, that church? Because the mysterious sephira that, is the other sephira that hides that mysterious amen that is an unfoldment of the three amens. And here we find another trinity or trimurti that is explained in many uh, religions as a uh, 
Abba, Aima, father, mother, and son, which could be Ben or Bet. Hebrew word for son and daughter. So we we ha we have to understand and comprehend and intuit, as we said in Kabbalah. The second Trimurti, which is directly related with the world of creation, that we call the world of Bria in Kabbalah. This holy Trimurti of the world of creation is uh, that Trimurti that in Egypt was called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. So do not mistake the first Trimurti with the second. The second one is that. Because it's the dissension of Osiris Ra into the world of creation. It modifies. It forms the other Trimurti, which in Christianity is called Yosef, Mary, and Jesus, and which in ancient Egypt was Osiris, Isis, Horus. This dissension of the three primary forces into that is uh, with the objective of originate creation, realization of these three primary forces. So, in that, and that level, which is beyond the sixth dimension, is where the logos create with the power of the word. As you see, the at is situated in the hieroglyphic of the tree of life, exactly at the level of the thought. In that, in that church, in that temple, is where it is written, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. This is the beginning with God. So it's there. The, the origin of the universe. But there, of course, the forces of the Holy Spirit, which is called Bina, Shiva, express themselves in the duality in order to create the universe, which is the sun. And that is the Amen. Again, Aleph here represents all the three primary forces together. That is the Aleph. In that. Then Mem, which is the mother, represents all the three primary forces above. In Isis. And then Horus, which is the outcome of Osiris and Isis, also manifests the three primary forces from above. This is something that we have to understand, comprehend. This Trimurti. Because from there, from that, for the Holy Gnostic Church, the transcendental. Gnostic Church of the Superior World is how descend the force into the physical world and to other dimensions. And there is where also descends Christ within any avatar, within any messenger, from any religion. Because religion is a word that means religare. So in order for the Lord descend, or to descend from that into the earth, it needs an avatar. It needs a messenger. Because the superior forces of Christ works in different times in order to help the lower Sephiroth, the world of Malkut, 
in the physical world to receive help. And the Lord does it through the sacraments. That's why in the physical world, the sacraments are instituted in order to guide the souls to this realization of these three primary forces. This is the only objective. So we have to know, to comprehend that. Because uh, people think that only the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church knows about these mysteries. Or they were instituted 2,000 years ago. But they ignore that these sacraments are eternal. It's related with the forces of the Lord that works in any planet. And these sacraments were known in Atlantis, which uh, at that time were uh, instituted by the great uh, powerful god Neptune. And that's why we state always that these sacraments come from a Neptunian Amentian past. Related, of course, with the mystery of the two polarities, men, woman, and the birth of the Son of Man. Now, the Son of Man, as you see, is below, in Tifereth. Tifereth, in Kabbalah, is a human soul. And when in the Bible we heard about the Son of Man, we have always understand that it is related with Tifereth, which is beauty, human soul. So that's why the sacraments, or the three amends, that uh, the Gnostic Church uh, gives, are for the soul, the psyche. This is precisely what we have to understand. The soul is that element that needs these sacraments in order to grow. This is Tifereth. The soul, the human soul, when applies the sacraments in the right way, instituted by the Gnostic Church, and then it grows and develops into what is called the Son of Man. The Son of Man is the final outcome of the sacraments. Because the Son of Man is the union, the communion, the religare, the yug of the human soul with Christ, of the human soul with Osiris Ra, of the human soul with the three amends, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if we go down from Tifereth, the Son of Man, the soul, we find the Sephira Yesod. In order to point directly, that all the sacraments that we are teaching here are related with a sexual force. Yesod is the sexual force. Yesod is directly related with the tree of knowledge, that which is directly a commandment given to the soul, Tiferes. If you know Kabbalah, you know that Tifereth is the sixth Sephira, or the Tree of Life. It's related with the sixth commandment. Here in the Gnostic Church, we explain the commandments, but we don't make a mess of them. Because outside, in other groups, who call themselves Christians, they have 
the commandments place in the wrong place, the wrong number. So the sixth commandment is you shall not fornicate. And it is because fornication is related with Yesod. The way in which we utilize the sexual energy in the wrong way. Is the first commandment given by Osiris Ra, the three primary forces, through that knowledge to the soul. If you observe, if you observe the middle pillar of the tree of life, you understand and comprehend why the first commandment given unto humanity is the sixth commandment. Moses wrote this commandment on number six. You shall not fornicate. Which people confuse with you shall not commit adultery. Which is another commandment. So, from that descends into the soul the first commandment which is directly related with Yesod. And this is why when the human soul disobey that commandment falls into Malkut, which is a physical world. Here we are in this physical body. This is what you have to understand and comprehend. Malkut is a physical body. Yesod is a is the vitality of this physical body, which is directly related with our sexual energy. And is directly related with the soul, in straight line to TFRS. But that means in order to perform the sacraments given by the Gnostic Church in that, by the Lord Christ, Related with the three primary forces, in and so or Ra, we have to follow and comprehend the sacraments. The first sacrament given is baptism. Every single Religion has their own particular baptism. And as uh, you can uh, observe in the Catholic Church, in the Orthodox Church, and many other religions that practice baptism, they baptize children, newborn children. And that gives us very wide explanation why the baptism is received in the childhood. Because that baptism is not for the physical body. It's for the soul. A newborn has a physical body, of course, but it's a physical body that is starting its evolution, its development. And when we observe a newborn, we see that the soul expresses itself through that body. You don't find in a newborn anger, lust, pride, greed, vanity, laziness, and all of those defects that we have in abundance. Only the pure soul. In other words, we will say Tifereth. Tifereth means beauty in Hebrew. So the beauty of the soul expresses itself through a newborn. And is to the sacrament of baptism how that soul is going to be guided in his life. But of course, that soul needs God parents. In other words, individuals that know about God. 
that will instruct that soul related with its own development. So the parents or the God parents of that child is supposed, like in ancient Egypt, were individuals that were initiates, that they knew about these mysteries that we are explaining here. In this day and age, the godparents are just uh, choice by different purposes, different causes. And uh, most of the time, they don't know even where they are standing. It's just a, it was a social requisite in different places. Baptism, of course, as you see, is directly related with the Asod. Because the waters of baptism are precisely in the sexual organs. The semen, which is the transformation of the blood. And the nun, the Messiah, is there. Which is the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth. Or we will say the element which is in the physical body that will... Uh, season the soul and all the personality of that child if he receives direct knowledge about that sexual energy. Because the personality that all of us have in this uh, society in order to interact with people is formed from the zero to the seven years in childhood. Unfortunately, in this day and age, you develop your personality, but your godparents never instruct you in relation with your inner soul. And the personality, in the end, when it's formed, is just related with the exterior world. And the goal of the parents, godparents, is to guide that soul in order not to use that union of the soul with the superior forces. Because in the baptism, the priest unites the forces, the superior forces of the three amends to that soul. Of course, that priest has the power to invoke the three primary forces because he himself is working with the sacraments. In order for us to be a priest, as you see, priesthood is related with the sixth uh, sacrament. In order to be, for you to be a priest, you have to be, fulfill five sacraments above, which are the sacraments, let us uh, name them. First, baptism. Second, penance. Third, communion. Four, confirmation. Fifth, matrimony. And sixth, priesthood. So in order for you to be a priest, you have to perform the five previous one, in order to know how to invoke the three amends and to, and to impart that into the soul, unite that soul. Because the baptism is a ceremony in which the priest, the Kohen, or the Kohen, as we say in Hebrew, is invoking as a magician, here, another word, magician, mag, which means priest, Superior forces in order to unite the superior forces to the soul, in order for the three primary amends to guide the soul. And for that, of course, as you see in the baptism, the child is beautiful dressed, but in a moment when he is going to receive the waters of baptism, the mem, the water, they, take, they make it naked. It symbolizes that nothing exterior should be in between the soul and the three amends. They give you salt to that baby, which is the noon. The salt in the water is that element that the child needs. The noon, the Messiah. Salt of the earth. 
but it needs to be transmuted, of course. And uh, and uh, some uh, religions or churches they blow their breath in the face of the child to symbolize the breath of God, the Aleph. Sometimes they do it toward the four corners of the world in order to conjure Satan. The forces, mechanical forces of nature that eventually will develop and enter into that child when he developed his personality. Because all of us, as you know, were beautiful, but we were children. Very innocent. But right now, none of you, or none of us, is innocent. We lost that innocence. So in order to conjure that, is baptized. And here's the tradition says, that with the baptism, we erase the sin of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve were the ones that ate the apple. That the, the original sin. We had to erase that original sin. But this is a symbol that we have to understand. Adam and Eve, of course, as you know, are the two polarities of the sexual energy. Related all the way with the testicles in the male and the ovaries in the woman. Two polarities, positive and negative. Adam and Eve. This is how they are called in alchemy. That's why we just state that all of us are children of Adam and Eve. Yeah, all of us are children of the two polarities, sexual polarities, positive and negative, male, female. And in the union of those two polarities, man and woman produce, of course, the child which the man represents Adam and the woman Eve. All of us are children of fornication because our parents didn't uh, transmute the sexual energy. And we bring that sin into the soul as well. So that uh, original sin is in every single soul. The baptism is the way in which symbolically we are receiving the waters and the parents, God parents, are holding candles with light which symbolizes that fire that eventually will rise in the spinal column in order to receive the illumination of the Holy Spirit. So, of course, you see there in this symbol of baptism all the elements that eventually the God parents will explain to the child in his own language, of course, about what is the light, what is the salt, and what is the water, and what is the air. In other rituals or baptism, the priest doesn't utilize uh, his breath because he understands that even though it represents Aleph, the breath of life of God, is sinful, is defect. So he utilizes always a feather of a bird, which in this case might be an eagle, and blow with a feather the air in the face of the baptized of the child. So, with the ceremony of baptism, then the soul is united to that ceremony, to the Holy Gnostic Church of the internal worlds. Then the masters instruct that soul internally and guide them. But I repeat, that soul needs instruction directly in the physical world. Because it's going to grow, it's going to develop personality, and the only ones that can instruct that in that way to the child are the parents, or the godparents, I mean, godparents. That's why it's called God parents. They represent in this way God. 
So then, of course, the child grows and reaches uh, the age of seven or eight, in which he has to receive the first communion, which is also called Eucharist. His first Eucharist. But let me read for you before entering into this uh, other sacrament that uh, part of the Bible which is related with baptism, which is in Mark chapter 10, 13, 16. And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Very I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. This is how Jesus, that represents, of course, the Son of Man, through which the three primary forces are expressing himself, themselves, is putting the energy into the souls of children. Of course, the ceremony of baptism is a ceremony that later on in life, that, uh, that soul, when he's ready to be married, will understand the other passage from John chapter 3, 1 to 8, in which there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do this miracle that thou dost, except God be with him. Here you understand very well, as we are explaining here, that this rabbi, which means master, which is Jesus, the other Nicodemus is telling him, we know that thou art a teacher or a master from God, because no man can do the miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. That God is Amenra, Osiris Ra, Christ, the three primary forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, acting through him. This is how we understand how those so-called miracles happened through the avatars, messengers of the high. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So here we see how this baptism is associated with Yesod. Because in order to be born again, you need a sexual energy. Nobody is being born by theories. All of us are children of a man and a woman in a sexual act. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is the Spirit. So to be born of the water and the Spirit is something that you have to know when you know alchemy. The mysteries of alchemy related with mercury, sulfur, and salt, which are related with the secretions 
of Jesod. Related with the symbols that we saw in the baptism, the candle, the fire, the water, which is precisely a fur into the child. The air symbolized by the blowing of the air by the priest. And the salt, which is the Messiah, the salt of the earth. That's why Jesus says in other chapters, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its saltness, with what are you going to uh, salt uh, the element or your, your own element? To season yourself? When you have sexual potency, it's because you have a lot of salt in your sexual secretions. A lot of noon. So with that you season your soul, your bodies, your mind, your spirit. But if the sexual potency loses the salt, loses the sperm, reaches in potency, no more energy, with what are you going to season yourself? That which is born of the spirit is a spirit. Because the spirit really is within the salt, which is the fire that burns inside of you, the holy fire of the Holy Spirit. The main thing is here how to release, how to free that fire, that spirit, which is within the water. Because the water is the zimin, and within the water is the salt, which is the nun, that had to liberate the fire. Is that the mystery of baptism that has to be performed when you grow up? Because first it's a symbol. Then you have to do it. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it is listening. You see the wind? Ruach in Hebrew is applied. The word ruach for the spirit and for Wind. So, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So, of course, when the, we read that, it comes into my mind the moment and when Jesus was symbolically being baptized in the Jordan. Because he, uh, in the Jordan, he found uh, John the Baptist, who baptized him with water. But that's a symbol, of course, that we have to understand. Because it is written that when Jesus received the baptism of John, he rose up from the waters. And that is a mystery, of course, of the coming of the Messiah from the very uh, waters of sexuality. Because the waters of the Jordan, or any type of waters of baptism, symbolize the sexual energy, the sexual matter. Mem. And from Mem, he is sunk into the water. And in the water, he receives the Nun, which is the Messiah, which is the sexual potency, the salt of the earth which is in the water. And he becomes and receives the Holy Spirit. When he comes out of the waters, the Holy Spirit, that fire, is entering into his body. And then the baptism is very clear there that says, this is my beloved son in which I am now entering. But you see, he is grown up already. Before that, as a child, as is written in the book of Luke, he was also initiated in the mysteries of baptism in the church of uh, Jerusalem. But now, as a grown-up man, he is performing it, of course, is written in symbols, in a symbolic way, in the gospel. You know how to read it, because it's a book of alchemy, Kabbalah. And from there, it was written that the Spirit took him into the wilderness. 
This is written in the book of Luke and many uh, Mark and, and Matthew. The Spirit took him into the wilderness to be, to be tested by the devil. There's here the second sacrament. It is not enough to be baptized. The exterior world, which is related with the prince of this world, which is the ego, as you know, which is always related with us, will test us. But I repeat, that's why the child has his godparents in order to teach the child. Do this, do that, be careful, you know, instructing him. Because the devil, Satan, which is the symbol of the ego of his parents or her parents, of his relatives, his friends, the world is full of ego. Everybody has a big ego. There are no one Satan or one devil. There are many devils, many Satans within. So this society is created by the ego, created by Satan. It's not one Satan, as I said. There are many. You carry that one of them inside of you. So the child had to be, of course, taught by the initiates, by the godparents, how to control, how to face that devil that he will eventually see in his parents, in his relatives, and everywhere. And this is the symbol how Jesus, after baptized, went taken to the wilderness. In ancient times, the wilderness was precisely the place where the initial was tested, but proof. Because in the wilderness, it states by many initiates that the demons or the beings from the darkness appear to test you. And it is written there that Jesus was test tested by the devil. Which devil? His own devil and the other forces of nature, of course, represented in the wilderness. But you said, you see be clear that he received the Holy Spirit and it says very clear there. And the Spirit took him to the wilderness. Because the Holy Spirit, which is the creator of life, is related with nature. And the goal is, of course, to receive the sacraments of the Holy Spirit, of the forces of power of nature. But for that you have to be tested and the Holy Spirit tests him. What is the shadow of the Holy Spirit? It's called uh, Satan. That wrong creation that we created because of our sexual sins, original sin. And this is why this sacrament called penance it says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy, Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit, into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. But that's the first temptation. Of course, Forty days in the wilderness. What is the number 40? In many lectures we told you that Mem is the letter related with the number 40. Every time that you read 40 is related with Mem. And of course, 40 days in the wilderness is equal at 40 years in the wilderness by the Israelites. They were also tested 40 years in the wilderness. 40 days of the rain in the universal flood of Noah. So Mem, of course, is directly related with Yesod, the waters of baptism. So we have to face life, the waters of life comes into my mind uh, the Aeneid of Virgil and also the Odyssey where Odysseus is in the sea in different places in different islands 
tested by Neptune, by Poseidon of the waters. That's another symbol of the 40 days, for the 40 years. The Holy Spirit, represented by Neptune, is testing always his neophytes. And this is how you are, of course, tested. And the one that is always receiving commandments and orders from Jehovah or Yod Chava, the Holy Spirit, Mem, is Satan, or in this case, Lucifer. Another aspect of the same force. If you read in the book of Job, then you realize how Job is tested by Satan. Under the commands of Jehovah, Mem, the Holy Spirit. This is how it is. Because you want to receive the sacraments. You want to go into the world and to be a vehicle of the Lord. Because you want to go ahead. In this case, Jesus represents that. He is, of course, he, wants, he was receiving the baptism, the forces of the Holy Spirit. Now he's being tested in order to serve as a vehicle of Christ. But for that, he has to overcome the three temptations. Which, of course, we are not going to explain in detail because uh, it's already explained in other lectures about the three temptations of the Lord, related with the three brains, in which, or the three amens. The first is, well, uh, Master Jesus answered after the temptation, if you are hungry, make this bread, uh, or these stones to, make, uh, to be bread. And he says, It is written that men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The word of God comes from the hat. Hmm? Got to be in communion with the forces of the hat, the Holy Gnostic Church. And for that, of course, you are always remembering. You always are tested when you are lacking something. Being in the wilderness, you have nothing. Zero. So... The Gnostics are always tested with that when they have nothing. Suddenly so comes offerings, temptations. Have this, have that, instead of being a vehicle of God. Because here you have 40 days, you receive nothing yet. So you want to be a king of the world? Says the ego, says your mind. Go and say who you are. That you are a powerful king. Go. I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. And of course, Jesus says, uh, the soul, the son of man, only kneels before God. Because only God, the soul, I mean the mind, should worship. Of course, he is he's being tempted by his own uh, mind. Because remember that the ego is mind. And always that temptation comes into you in different levels. And if you really are a son of God, why, why don't you go up into the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself? In other words, fornicate. And uh, because God, of course, or, or whatever, adultery or fornication is related with sex. To be in the pinnacle of the temple is to be in the higher level, in Keter. Why you have to go to Yesod and have sexual act when you shouldn't? That you be in chastity, to not fornicate. And that's why Jesus says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. How, how do you understand that? You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. In your body, of course. The power of God is in sex. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God when you roll the, the knowledge. Just keep ahead. Don't tempt him. 
Because he acts through the sexual act. Not the penance. And of course, the penance is always related in many religions, especially Catholicism, with the Lent. The Lent started uh, Wednesday. It's called uh, Ash Wednesday. The people go and receive a, a cross of ashes in the forehead. It will say that in order for you to behave before the celebration of uh, uh, Easter, Holy Week, that is, of course, in this last Wednesday until Good Friday. Stated in some places that uh, they shall not eat meat every Friday, neither Good Friday. And beginning with Wednesday as well, the Ash Wednesday. What is that? Don't eat meat. Oh, but the meat, of course, is in relation with fire. Beef is the element that hides the fire. Is there that you shall not eat meat? It means that you shall behave during these 40 days in order to suffer the passion of the Lord. But this is within you. Because what is what we want? We want to suffer the passion of the Lord inside the soul. We want this soul of us to become the son of man. And in order for the soul of us to become a son of man, we have to suffer the passion of the Lord. And the first one is the baptism. Now we are in a penance. And that's why uh, it is written that uh, you have to confess the sins to God. In certain traditions, you go and confess your sins to the priest. And they said, go and, and pray, God Father, or the Creed, uh, or the Apostles' Creed, or the Hail Mary, in order to release from that uh, uh, sin. Penance really is related with what we call expiation. To expiate is to erase certain karmas that we have. And for that, of course, we need to meditate. To be in the wilderness reminds me to be a yogi. To meditate, to analyze, to reflect in your own life. And all of this, of course, had to be taught by the godparents to the child who was baptized, who is growing up. How to meditate. Meditation is precisely indispensable in order to suffer the karma, penances, in order to expiate, in order to go into our own Lent. That Lent, of course, Endure the whole life. Like Odysseus. Suffering here, suffering there. And always remembering your own being. Your own self. And your particular individual Lent. Traditions are celebrations. In which the people uh, celebrate these things. But they ignore. What, what is that? Sometimes they don't eat meat, only fish, just because they read about or they heard about, but they don't know why. What is the fish? The fish is the noon. You understand that? Noon of Amen, the end, symbolizes the fish. In the Lent, you shall only eat fish. That means that during the whole life in your Lent, in your ordeals, in your penances that you are passing through, you have to transmute, you have to take care of your sexual energy, of your noon, the salt of the earth. So the noon, the, the, the fish and the salt are related to the water, 
to the 40 days of Lent, to the 40 days in the wilderness. Meaning that you shall not fornicate. You shall dedicate to passion, which is a symbol of the meat that only feeds that. You only have to eat fish. But in order to eat fish, you have to know how to transmute your sexual energy. And that's why you receive first the baptism in the Jordan. Now that you know the mysteries of the Jordan, which is the baptism, go into the wilderness and keep transmuting, eating only fish, only noon, the Messiah. That's to eat. To eat fish is to eat, to swallow the Messiah. So that's why when you are ready, comes the other sacrament, which is the Holy Communion, the Eucharist. And would you also eat the flesh of the Lord and the blood, you drink the blood of the Lord. It's another sacrament that everybody receives, but without knowing why. The first communion is the, four, the first common union. That first common union is the union of the soul with the spirit. And in order to assist you in that path, they celebrate in a ritual in the physical world the first communion. In which the girl or the boy is dressed beautifully, representing that the soul, in order to acquire the first communion or the union with God, has to dress beautifully. This is the symbol of the solar bodies, the internal bodies, that are being created with noon, with fish. When you eat fish, you create your solar bodies. Because in the fish is the salt, the transmutation of your salty elements. Zodiacal salts of your sexual energy. And of course, you have to learn that with, in the, in the, in the Holy Communion. You receive the Eucharist, in order to receive another assistance, the bread of God, the solar force that had to be performed by a priest, in which the priest, through magic, mag, priest, through special ceremonies, bring down the three amens to a ceremony into the bread and into the wine. That represents, the wine represents the blood comes from the grape and the bread from the wheat. That is the, 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 the body of the Lord. Because the solar energy makes the wheat to grow up, to, to grow, and also the, the grape. By dint of forces of magic, ritualistic conjurations and invocations, the solar force descends to that vehicle. That vehicle is the son of man. Is that soul that is dedicated to the Lord. But of course, in order to perform that, you need to know how to take care of your sexual energy. That's why the priest is in celibate. But of course, the true priest has to be married. But we are not arriving that, there yet. The sacrament of uh, First Communion, you have to understand and to comprehend that you have to keep that union with God as a soul by practicing your penances. By knowing how to transmute your sexual energy. That's why in the ceremony of uh, Communion, they always carry in their hands a candle and a book. That book symbolizes the book of alchemy, knowledge, wisdom that you need in order to do that first communion. You have to learn. And of course, I repeat, in the first communion, sometimes they change godparents. Sometimes they keep the same ones. 
But the, the duty of the godparents is to teach that child that receiving that sacrament in order to perform and to do it in himself. Because the first communion usually begins at seven. When the second testicular layer in the man originates his own manhood. And in the woman, is, her ovaries are given those element, vital elements that uh, synthesize her own womanhood. It's defining sex there, strongly. To receive a, 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 a right instruction related with the two polarities. And in order to fall into the stupidities of this day and age and which they start justifying from that uh, time they're teaching the child to justify the generation which is another uh, another thing that really uh, amazes me is that in the present society everybody is always uh, punishing and accusing uh, all those degenerate that uh, abuse uh, children they said that uh, uh, a soul that has not 18 years old shouldn't allow to be uh, or to seduce or to drink alcohol or to to be sexually uh, uh, freedom to have freedom in sex, but only when they are adult, they have freedom to degenerate themselves. When you are not 18 or 21 year old. You are prohibited to drink, you are prohibited to do anything, and there is a law here that even send people to jail if they abuse a teenager. But once they are 18 or 21, they are free to do whatever, to degenerate themselves, to drink, etc. They are free. What is that type of law? It doesn't make any sense. To keep the youth healthy, so when you are adult, you can squander all your life. Stupidity. Completely. This type of knowledge or teaching should be this from childhood until, until death. But this is precisely how our society is, unfortunately. So then you see, after communion comes confirmation. As the word uh, explained, confirmation is to confirm, to confirm the previous sacraments that you are going to go and to receive a confirmation is because you already know what is penance, what is communion what, uh, what, what is baptism and because you want to go ahead usually confirmation comes when you enter into your teenage like 14 sometimes women do, uh, uh, do it before that age because puberty the sexual energy, the sperms in the testicles of, of the man are being developed or beginning to develop at 14 or 13. Women, they start menstruating 12, sometimes 11, before men. They, they mature faster than the male sex. That is the age in order to see confirmation. Because that is the age in which the children are going to receive the forces of Venus in their sexual energy. And their whole mind, feelings are going to change drastically because of hormones. They will start looking to the other side, to the other sex, if they are not degenerated, if they are being born with a, a natural good body. Because the natural thing is to see a woman, to see, start seeing the males. The male seeing the female. That's natural. Because the sperm is that magnetism that attracts the ovum. And the ovum is that element that attracts the sperm. That's natural in nature. But in confirmation, you have to receive the knowledge about that. Explicit sexual knowledge. Because you have to keep ahead in your realization of your soul. Or the three amens. The other sacrament. 
It's always instituted. Usually also the, the neophyte receives in the forehead the chrisma, the cross on the forehead that's saying, remember that you have to annihilate your ego. Sometimes they do it with ashes. That's been in the mind here, the cross on the forehead with ashes. He's telling you, your ego is dust, and to dust you have it has to return. You have to annihilate your sinful ego. Because remember that you are walking in the sacraments. So you have to work against your ego. That's why the cross there. And of course the priest or the bishop put the hands on the head in order to implant the Holy Spirit. To give the Holy Spirit to the child. That, of course, is something that uh, is only possible when the priest is channeling the three amens in himself. Because if the priest is not channeling that, if he's not doing it practically, how is he going to implant the Holy, or give the Holy Spirit? A fornicator, somebody that squanders the sexual matter, the sexual energy, through masturbation, or to, by any means, cannot implant the Holy Spirit. Even if he has many titles and has the investiture of a priest, he cannot do it. Only that one that respects the, the previous uh, sacraments. And that's why this is a bishop. He's already uh, invested as a bishop because he is more than a priest. That can implant and give that because he's a, a higher initiate that know about these three primary forces. Usually the bishop comes and uh, when the child, the teenager comes and implant that, he slap his face. Like telling him, awake! And be careful. Because you are entering into a certain age that if you don't control your sexual energy, you will fall off the path and you will no longer be connected with the inner church. Because in order to be connected with the Holy Gnostic Church, with the sacraments of Christ, you have to keep ahead in your path. Of course, it is here in the confirmation, what in Judaism called Bar Mitzvah or Bat Mitzvah. What Mitzvah or Bat Mitzvah means? Son or daughter of the commandment. It means that when the teenager is receiving, like in the Jewish law, his Mitzvah, it is because he's being instructed by his particular godparents in the commandments of God. It's a young child, a youngster, is that right? entering into another world, which is the world of sex, in which he has to learn how to transmute his sexual energy. And this is related with this passage in the Bible. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? It's a question of a youngster to the master Jesus, which in this case represents the bishop. And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Gedula, the innermost, that is good. But if thou willest enter into life, keep the commandments. Hmm? You are a teenager, you want to go ahead and keep ahead in your confirmation, to confirm your path with your inner God, well, follow the commandments. Then, he said unto him, I mean the youngster, 
as to Jesus. Uh, which Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, thou shalt not fall to witness, honor thy father and thy mother, inner father, inner mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, spread the knowledge. The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what like I yet? You see, all of these things because he was guided by his parents. Was kept. Hmm? So he's being confirmed. And then Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. That's the next step. Because you are already in an age that you can help others. To give what you already have. There are a lot of people in Egypt that receive from childhood all of these elements. And they reach that childhood, uh, that teenager or puberty. And they just keep squandering the sexual energy. And they don't do anything ahead. They receive, of course, the ceremony, the sacrament, but nothing. Because they don't receive any instruction. And why? Because the one that should give the instruction, which are the priest, the bishop, the godparents, know nothing about it. They just follow mechanically traditions without knowing the, the why and the, the reason. That's why I said, when the young man heard the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Those possessions are psychological possessions. Knowledge. But selfishly, selfishly, they don't want to give away. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I said unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. In another Verse here related with this confirmation. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment, commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than this. So what is that? The commandments. The confirmation. You have to follow the commandments. But too many commandments. Well, synthetize. What is the great commandment? Is the first one. Hear, O Israel. Who is Israel? If you know Kabbalah, you know that Jacob in Kabbalah is Tifereth. He's the one that works in the stone of Yesod and that fights against an angel in order to get the strength. That angel is Samael in a Scorpio, the sexual strength. You fight with that and you gain, you go ahead. And then you no longer, the name is Jacob, but Israel. Is, is, ish is fire. Ra is the solar force of Amon Ra. El is God. The forces of Israel is the fire of the God Ra that is sent in you. That's the meaning of the name in esotericism. This is all you Israel because the other parts of Tifereth are bottled up into the ego which are in Egypt suffering. So here all Israel is all the parts of your soul in your body. The Lord our God 
is one. So we have to self-realize ourselves, to make that God one. Because many parts of God are bottled up in our defects, vices, and errors, sins. We have to take all the defects, erase them, disintegrate them, and to make God one inside of us. And then, you shall love thy God with all thy heart. Your astral body, your emotional center here, has to have an astral vehicle. You shall love thy God with all thy soul. You have to create the causal body. The body of the soul. The body of Tifreth. You shall love thy God with all thy mind. You have also built your mental body. Because the Lord needs to create. The solar body. The astral solar. The mental solar. And the causal solar body. And you shall love thy God with all thy strength. The sexual strength. You have to apply all that which in the teenage and your the age of uh, Venus goes with a strength in your sexual energy. That's your strength. All your strength has to be applied in order to fulfill what we are telling you here. And when you fulfill with all your strength, with all your sexual strength, the creation of the astral body, your, your heart, the creation of the mental body, your mind, and the creation of the causal body, your soul, because Tiferet is the causal world, then you have the three bodies there that you created with all your strength. And then you are fulfilling the first commandment. You shall love thy God with all the strength of above all things. And when you do that, and then you go, and thy neighbor as thyself. Thyself is your own soul, your own spirit. Not your self-ego, your self-esteem. That is not thyself. Because people, of course, take that commandment in the wrong way. To love thyself, they are, oh, they are loving their lust, their anger, their pride, and all the degeneration that they have within and they feed them with the sexual energy. God wants all, all, only your mind, your heart, and your soul, and your strength. That's the first commandment. And you fulfill that, then you are going out of being rich. Because when you are in the confirmation, you receive then that uh, statement of the rich. He says, what should I do? Well, all these commandments I, I, I followed since I was a child. Well, now you are entering into your teenager. You have a sexual energy. Well, follow the commandments. Otherwise, you will go astray. And of course, the hot parents should teach him. In ancient Egypt, these children had initiates at hot parents. And they were being taught how to create, how to transmute in the great pyramids where this uh, were, uh, was instituted. And they were developing, creating, entering into the initiation. And they were keeping ahead in the sacraments. Because that's the way. So therefore, after the confirmation, eventually, when they reached 21 years old, the age in which they had to marry, they have to fulfill the sacrament of marriage. It is a stupid to be married before 21 in a man and before 18 in a woman. Because the sexual act is only logical to perform when you are 21 and when the woman is 18. They to perform the other sacrament. Because all of these sacraments that you receive are being fulfilled and not being performed in the sexual matrimony. When men and women unite in sexual matrimony. And the third day, there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Who is the mother of Jesus? Who is the mother of the Son of Man? It's a divine mother. Mem. Aima. The internal mother that said you have to honor 
father and mother. The mother, when you are following these sacraments, is always there. So the mother of Jesus was there. This is how you have to understand this symbol. And both, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. You see, that's the holy sacrament of marriage. Hidden there very carefully, very smartly, in these uh, paragraphs. And when they wanted wine, the wine of transmutation, which is the sexual transmutation, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Meaning, the Kundalini is not really awakened there. They are just newly married. And then, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what I have to do with thee? I mean, the human soul has to do with the Divine Mother. In order for the mine hour is not yet come. The hour of uh, marriage, which is the ninth hour. His mother said unto his servants, Whatsoever he said unto you, do it. Of course, the priest, who is a priest, has to know how to teach. Had to tell them what to do before the sexual act. This is symbolized in many ways. In ancient times, it was symbolized by the honeymoon. And when the priest, the initiate was instructing the couple to keep ahead in the sacraments. And then, it says there that uh, there were set six water pots. Six, which is the mystery of the six arcanum, which is the mystery of the lovers. Adam and Eve. Number six. And after the money of the purifying of the Jews. You need to purify, you know, your soul. You have to know how to transmute the sexual energy. Containing two or three firkins as spice. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. This is the first thing that the man and woman does. To fill the water pots, which are, or the water pots, of course, are the sexual organs. When you are filling with water, then... They fill them up to the brim. And this is how we do it. And he said unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. Governor of the feast. And they bear it. Then the ruler of the feast hath tasted the water that was made wine. This transmutation of water of wine is performed in the weddings. It means that the waters of the sexual matter energy are transformed, transmuted into the wine of the spirit through the sexual act, through alchemy. Because the miracle of transmuting water into wine is a miracle of alchemy. The alchemists perform that. And sexual alchemy is to transmute that water into wine. To keep it ahead. And to the holy matrimony is how this uh, soul is going to start creating the astral body, the mental body, the causal body, in order to become a priest. In other words, in order to become a priest of God, a prophet of God, a messenger of God, directly, you have to perform the sacrament of marriage. A single person can also worship and perform things, but to incarnate the three primary forces, the three amens, in the way that we are spending here, you have to marry. You need the two polarities. That's why Jesus instituted the holy matrimony. And all the mysteries of all religions always are in the family, in the marriage in order to perform and to develop that inside of you. Because it is the salt of the earth, the noon, which is in the sexual energy, the one that will originate to give all of those elements when you know how to transmute them. This is how the three amends are developed within the human organism. No fornicator can develop that. In this day and age, people marry. And uh, they just squander the sexual energy. They marry in order to fornicate. 
What is the difference between the sexual act of, uh, of uh, human beings that perform that with a lot of ceremony and the sexual act of animals? There is no difference. The couple of animals, they unite, they fornicate. They squander the sexual energy. The same thing as uh, uh, the couples that marry. What is the difference? It's a sacrament. They perform the sacrament before the altar, but they don't do it. They don't transmute it. They don't do anything. The holy sacrament of matrimony is in order to be born again. That's why it was instituted. And this is how the rules of the sacrament of the Holy Gnostic Church are instituted. That were instituted in ancient times and in the beginning of the mystery of Jesus. Because Jesus implanted these sacraments in Rome. Peter was the one that received those sacraments in order to institute it into the priesthood. Peter was the first pope, according to tradition. Well, Peter was married. Peter was not single, was not celibate. He had his wife. Because he was uh, following the, the rules. And you know that Peter symbolizes the pineal gland, the sexual energy, the mystery of the stone. You are Peter, stone. And upon this stone, I will build my church. In other words, after you start transmuting your sexual energy as a couple in, in the holy matrimony, then the doors are open for you in order to be a priest. Sometimes you can be a priest as a single, as a celibate, but those priests and celibates that were being priests were preparing themselves in order to marry the nuns, you see? And this is precisely very significant here. The word nun, N-U-N, is the same letters in order for the word, the word nun. Do you realize that? Do you get it? A priest has to be married with a nun, because without the nun, he cannot transmute his nun, his salt. And of course, he becomes a real priest that handles the forces of nature, because the woman has the forces of nature. And if the woman has to have a, a priesthood as well, a priestess, he has to have his, uh, his, uh, her husband, her priest, priest and priestess, men and women, husband and wife, that is. But who is following that now? Priests in this day and age, they marry, they perform the sacrament of matrimony for the common and ordinary people. But they themselves are not married, how are they going to perform something that they don't have any experience? And before that, they ex advise the couples about marriage. How are they going to advise a married couple when they are not married? They don't know anything. If you read in the Bible, the, the, some of the apostles' uh, epistles, letters of Paul, stated there, how, what do you need in order to be a bishop, in order to be a priest? You have to be married with children. Because if you don't know how to govern your own house, how are you going to govern the, the, the church, the house of the Lord? How are you going to manage that? In other words, it says, if you don't manage, as a married couple, the forces of God through your sex and to the way that you have to do it in the matrimony, how are you going to manage to bring down the forces of the house of God of that into a ceremony? That's the meaning of it. How are you going to do it? That's priesthood. And that's why in this day and age, that is collapsing, because if they have uh, the priest, they have uh, the other partner, the other uh, polarity there, they use it just for to, to fornicate. It's very rare a priest really that keep the celibacy. Because in order to keep the celibacy, in order to really transmute the sexual energy, you need to have to know the mysteries of matrimony. And after that comes the last of the sacraments, extreme unction, extreme unction, extreme unction, which is precisely the one in which you heal the sick. A priest really is the one that knows how to control the forces of nature, how to administer ceremonies in which you heal the sick, in which you take uh, exorcisms in order to take out uh, uh, devils and all that which is written in the Bible. 
that the apostles have that power. In the Gnostic Church, of course, we know all of this. And we know how to perform different elements, different ceremonies in order to heal the sick. How to invoke the angels of medicine in order to help others. And everything is possible when the law of karma uh, allows it. But, of course, if you are not a real priest, how are you going to perform the sacraments? To finish with this, let me read for you the ceremony of uh, extreme unction. And when Jesus was come into Peter's house, he saw his wife, his wife's mother, in other words, the mother-in-law of Peter, laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with the word, and healed all of that were, that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So, of course, these are the sacraments that any priest developed if he fulfills from the beginning until the end. Okay, questions? They're standing me there that I had to... Because... This is too much, they say. Talk about uh, Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, Easter. What does it mean, Holy Thursday? The what? Holy Thursday. Holy Thursday. Well, that's a ceremony related, the higher level, with the erasing of the sins of past reincarnations. The erasing of uh, the sins of past incarnations, so still all the sins, all the, the crimes that we committed in the last incarnation, are printed in symbols that only a uh, master can understand, in the soles of your feet. That is what is written there. So when Christ is washing the feet of his apostles, that means that he is even performing a cleanse of his soul related with past lives. All the crimes that that soul committed. Is being erased in the ceremony of the washing of feet. And uh, it's also uh, it's helpful. There is a ceremony of that in the Holy Gnostic Church. But that has to be performed by someone that is performing all of this. Because if you are not following the sacraments, the previous sacraments, you can receive the title of priest, as many have received the title of priest, but they are just disconnected. <laughs> Because you have to be connected to the three primary amens in order to do that. There are the sacraments that were instituted by Christ in the physical world 2,000 years ago and that were performed in Egypt before. It's a very ancient. It's nothing new. So that relation with the Holy, or, or Holy Thursday. Yeah, question? Well, the one that is uh, given the knowledge has to be in contact with the superior forces. And when you receive the knowledge from any instructor, from any preacher, you have to listen inside of you and to make uh, a sense of it in order, as you said, not to worship an idol. Because if you really don't understand the commandments, if you don't understand the, the sacraments, and you just following it mechanically, of course you are worshipping an idol. That's why it is indispensable to meditate in every single sacrament in order not to follow an idol. This lecture that I'm giving you is the outcome of my own reflection. Because I don't want to follow idols. 
I had to understand what it is precisely to do the penance and all that. I know many sacraments, but the people that enter into those sacraments in the Holy Gnostic Church have to previously receive instruction in order not to commit the mistake of worshipping personalities. That is, worshipping idols or the egos of other people. Yeah? The sacraments of the Gnostic Church, of course, are being performed uh, in every single Gnostic organization. But for that, the disciple, as you see, has to, to gain the right to enter. So there are secret, sacred, secret commandments, rule. This is what we said, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Sabaot. That is relation with the three amens. That means holy, 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 Lord of hosts. Because the three primary forces descend. And in order for you to have the benefit of receive Kadosh, Kadosh, Adonai Sabaoth, you have to really be in chastity. You really have to follow the rules. This knowledge is giving here freedom and free, no problem. But in order for you to assist and receive the sacraments of the Holy Gnostic Church, you have to gain it. Because it's serious. It's a, for those that want to follow the path. You have to be in chastity. You have to be serious. Not uh, playing with this. You know? No fornicator can enter into the kingdom of God. Because if you become as children, then you can enter into the kingdom. If you will become as children, then you can receive the sacraments. But if you have to justify your own defect, your own vices, your own degeneration, how are you going to receive the sacraments? Even if they descend, are rejected. Of course, I explained it. The only way to descend those is by, by knowing how to control the three primary forces related with your three brains. First, you have to do that. That's why in a reunion of a church, an ecclesia, as we said, is the gathering of forces. Every single person gathers the forces of the Lord in his own level. And all of them are doing the same thing. Of course, the energy descends with strength. But what you will see, for instance, in those gatherings in the church and ecclesias, when each person is a fornicator, an adulterer, and the priest is also is, uh, squandering the sexual force, they are performing the ritual, but it's nothing. It's just like a ceremony when you don't see any force. You have... The people that follow that and the priests had to follow the rules of the three amens, of the sac sacred amens. Kadosh, kadosh, sacred, sacred, sacred. The question is, does in order for to be a priest or to, or, or to do the sacraments of the Gnostic Church in the physical world, well, you need to be in chastity. Not necessary to be married. But in order to perform all the sacraments, which are very high forces, and to channel through you, you have to be married. Because the body is, 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 a, is an antenna. It's an organism that channels the forces. But if they channel the force according to your own development, your own spiritual development. That's why you see an avatar, that the Master Samael, for instance, when he was performing certain ceremonies, of course he, he had no ego. And he was exactly an avatar. The son of man there, clearly, in front of us. Christ was, of course, descending and, and doing everything through him. The ceremony of what we call the extreme unction in different ways. 
Because uh, this doesn't mean that you have to do it exactly in a, in a church, in a temple, the extreme unction. You can do it in the, in the forest. You can do it everywhere because you, as Jesus, he has the power healing the sick everywhere. Right? Of course, in order to develop that, you have to be married. It's impossible to develop the kundalini, the seven powers of the tongues of fire of the Holy Ghost, if you are single. You have to be married in order to develop that. But in order to be a priest, yeah, a single person can do it in his own level. But a married person, of course, is working with the fire. It's better. So you have to remain there. Because the problem is that in ancient times, many single people started doing their priesthood as single. But then the, they thought that it was enough. And they didn't marry. So they just get stagnant at that level. We got to go further. Is one granted matrimony after going after completing the previous four? Or does one take the initiative to find a partner? How does that happen? Well, the partner, of course, has to come to you according to karma, according to destiny. And uh, if you have your partner, like for instance in, in other uh, traditions, like in the Hindu traditions, they marry when they are young. But they don't perform the sexual act until the moment in which they should. I mean, it comes into my mind this great uh, avatar, Ramakrishna, that he received the, co the order of his inner being to marry a baby. According to the Hindu tradition, he went to the house and said, well, according to the family and traditions, I had to marry your girl. But it was a baby. So they performed the wedding ceremony there. And they said, okay, I will come in 18 years. Bye-bye. And then he was married. When the girl was 18, then he came and said, okay, come with me. And he continued doing the ceremony of matrimony. And that, is, that answers your question, right? Wow, but that's something that's so far away from a totally different tradition. It doesn't matter. Any tradition always follows the same rules. We are rolling into the Gnostic Church, but the same rules are for the Holy Spirit. Shiva, the one that rules the, the ceremonies in India, is the same Holy Spirit in Christianity. It's the same Bina. The thing that they follow in different ways. Of course, in this way, in Christianity, you find your partner, but in the ancient times also were not like that. The family was finding your, your, your wife. Or vice versa, right? But in this day and age, of course, you find the woman that you liked, well, you have to wait until you are ready to marry and to do it. And if you are already married and doing it in the wrong age, well, instead of fornicating, transmute. Logical. Because it's better to transmute than to be burned. Yeah? Yeah, they say that, of course, uh, uh, all the sacraments performed in the, in the church as a ceremony are symbols. But in those symbols, of course, the priest has the power to bring down the forces of the three amens in order to help the neophyte to do what they had to do in life. The baptism, in this case, of course, uh, is a ceremony in which is uniting the soul with the holy forces of the Gnostic Church internally, the churches of Christ, and they have to follow it by uh, different uh, practices and ways in which the godfather, go godparents, had to guide the soul. At that age, of course, it's, uh, the children receive through uh, tales, through different ways, the story of the Bible, the story of things that their infant mind, infantile mind, has to learn. And when they are already uh, feeling the energy, sexual energy is there, uh, also, they had to know how to uh, transmute them, how to sublimate them. So when they are reaching, of course, teenager, they receive more uh, uh, instruction related with the same thing 
because the sexual energy in a teenager is stronger than uh, of a child that is from the 7 to 14 years old. And then keep ahead in order to, when we reach the matrimony, they are already transmuting the sexual energy as a single person, so their body is accustomed to it. So then they keep transmuting. This is, as Paul says, being married as, you, as if you are single. And you keep ahead. Because your body is learning. But unfortunately, of course, in this day and age, you come to Gnostic uh, knowledge. And you're already fornicating and squandering your energy through masturbation, etc. And then you want to teach the body. Well, unfortunately, that's our karma. And it's a great fight that you had to do. Because unfortunately, you were not taught in childhood about it. At what age should children start the practice of transmutation? At the age when you see that a child has a curiosity for sex because the hormones, hormones are there, then you have to teach them. What happens to the other six uh, sephirahs? What about the forces of those other six sephirahs? Yeah, the, the other sephira of sephira the other columns. Yeah, of course. But for that, you have to, we had to work. We are explaining there directly how the three primary forces work in direct to the soul. And the other columns that are, or the other sephirahs, which are in the other side and the other columns, well, you have to work with them. This is called the self-realization. The inner realization of that is a process. But it is done always through the middle pillar. You reach a certain level, whatever, you keep ahead or self direct path. And this is long path. This is not that easy. As many people think that because they receive baptism, confirmation, etc., they are ready to go to heaven after they die. Right? It is not like that. You have to perform what you learn. If you don't perform what you learn, you are not going to heaven. But to limbo. And thank you very much, and have a nice weekend. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,